The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, folks. This is Dr. Charlie Hall here, holder of the Ellison Chair in International Floriculture here at Texas A&M University. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. I'm joined uh, by Dr. Marco Palma, who is the co-organizer of today's webinar. So uh, uh, we're, we're both glad to have you here with us today. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our sponsors, uh, TNLA is sponsoring today's webinar in conjunction with the Southern Risk Management Education Center. And we have a great lineup for you today. Uh, we have a Texas legislative update. And um, so I'm assuming most of the folks online are, are Texans uh, that, that are participating. Just FYI, you are eligible to get one hour of a TNLA CEU as part of being involved in today's broadcast. Now, as you go through um, uh, today and you have some uh, degree of control over your webinar experience, you've got a control panel that you'll see uh, depicted in the upper right-hand side of this particular slide. And in that control panel, you've got different options. You've got a, a little orange button there where you can open and close your, your panel. You just click on that. It opens and closes. And you can make your... Uh, the PowerPoint that, that in front of you is uh, you can make that full screen or you can confine it to a window and you can also change your audio if you have any degree of difficulty with your microphone and speakers you might pop over and use the telephone because sometimes folks can get a little better sound quality by using the telephone but if you're if you're good to go with your microphone and speakers don't worry about it now, everybody is muted today, so even if your microphone is working, you won't be able to say anything to us because um, uh, we want you to type in your questions in the questions box that you see uh, outlined here on the left-hand side of this slide. So as we go through, and you've got uh, a question for Jim and our other speakers, but why be sure to type that question, and then Marco and I can monitor those questions and and ask those accordingly. And um, we're going to try to answer most of the questions at the end of the day's session, but if there's something that's pertinent to what Jim is saying at that particular point in time, we, Jim, we might interrupt you to, uh, to get that question in. Now, there is a very short evaluation survey at the, at the end. We would greatly appreciate you filling out that five-question evaluation. It would take you all of about 46 seconds to do it, and we would appreciate that because uh, to re continue receiving the grant funding to, to cover the cost of the, the GoToWebinar software, it's important for us to show good impacts. And so if you'll fill out that evaluation survey, it would, it would help us. It's not to make Marco and I feel good about... Uh, uh, or, or to make our presenters feel good for their the pr presentation, it's it's really to help us justify the use of bringing this webinar series to you. So we fr we we appreciate your doing that and helping us out. Now everyone is going to receive an email today, or, or probably within the next 24 hours, with a link to the recorded version of today's session because. Uh, I know that things happen. I've already gotten a couple of emails this morning from folks that, that had something come up and they couldn't join us live. And I said, don't worry about it because we're going to be recording it. So if you get interrupted, um, I offer that same thing to you. Now, we have a, a pretty full agenda for the next uh, 56 minutes. We're going to um, cover some of the legislative happenings some of the things coming down the pike that are going to be interesting to green industry owners and operators. So our speaker today is, is uh, Jim Reeves. He's the Director of Legislative and Regulatory Affairs with Texas Nursery and Landscape Association. And um, he's, he's assured me that he's had enough coffee that, that uh, he's, he's sufficiently wired. And, and, of course, he's been very busy over the last several weeks with uh, the legislative session in progress. So. Jim, without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to you. Well, thanks, Charlie, and, and good morning to everybody. I appreciate you taking an hour out of your Friday morning to 
to visit about uh, legislative and regulatory issues that affect your business. Um, I'd like to start out and say that, that this session, your TN TNLA legislative lobby team uh, has grown a little. Uh, last session, we hired uh, Gavin Massengill to help lobby with us. He's on contract uh, with the association. He has spent uh, many years at the Capitol. He understands our issues. Um, so we've got him on board again this year. Uh, former State Representative Sid Miller, who most of you probably have heard of or may know. He is a nurseryman uh, out of Stephenville, Texas. Uh, he lost his reelection bid last November, actually last, uh, last summer. And um, we, we have hired him on as well to help assist us with legislation. He, he won't have uh, major, major jobs with us, but if something big does come up, uh, we will utilize his, his efforts and skills. Um, January 8th of this year, the legislature went into session, it's the 83rd legislative session. It's my 10th legislative session. Uh, they meet for 140 days every two years. There's a lot of jokes that go around that they should only meet every 140 years for two days. <laughs> and, and sometimes that, that is quite true. Um, it's, uh, it's been a hectic few weeks, to say the least. Things are in full swing, and I'll, I'll get to some of the details later on in the presentation. Uh, we got uh, one bill that has to pass every, every session. The Constitution requires that we pass a state budget. And this budget that, that they're debating right now will go into effect September 1st of this year. And it's a two-year budget. And usually the state budget is around 170 to $190 billion for the buy-in. Um, right before the legislative session, the comptroller, Susan Combs, she is required by the Constitution to give the legislature a revenue estimate. And it's basically just telling them what they can spend. And it can increase. Uh, it can only increase by a certain amount depending on a percentage of inflation. So she, she gave that estimate three or four weeks ago, and she's saying we can spend around $101 billion of state funds uh, for the next biennium. Now, the federal government, they kick in around 70 or $80 billion as well. Uh, so that puts the total, you know, somewhere around $180 billion. Um, the inflation issue is, is kind of interesting. Uh, we've got a rainy day fund. It's kind of our savings account, and it is doing incredible right now. It's around $8 billion. Uh, the comptroller was with us a couple weeks ago at a meeting, and she said by August of next year we'll have around $15 billion in that fund. So there's a big debate going on right now if, if spending that rainy day fund or portions of it is going to count against this inflation cap. There's a lot of lawyers looking into it and I, I don't know where it's going to go, and uh, it'll be interesting to see. I, I don't think I've ever seen them be in this predicament before. But um, it's great that we have the money in the fund. There's some things that need to be, or some funding cuts that need to be restored. I mean, last session, the education budget was cut $5.5 billion. They'll probably put some back into education. Um, they didn't fully fund Medicaid last year in the budget because it, they had to pass a budget that was balanced. So they passed House Bill 10 last week, which will put $4.5 billion into Medicaid to keep funding it through the end of this fiscal year. Um, so that, that's some of, the, some of the things that have happened on the, the House floor. It, that bill will be on the Senate floor on Monday afternoon. Um, Let's talk about the budget just a little bit. Um, Senate Bill 1 uh, is rumored to be voted out of committee on March 13th. Uh, today is the deadline in the House. If, in, if anybody wants to uh, try to get some additional appropriations for a project, uh, they have to have their request in by 5 o'clock this afternoon. Um, I'm going to switch gears here a little because I want to lead into some other budget stuff. 
But last year, TNLA, along with the Texas Retailers Association and Scott's Miracle Grow, we formed Texas Water Smart. And we did this actually in reaction to the North Texas Municipal Water District trying to go to stage four on water restrictions, which would have crippled the nursery and landscape industry in that part of the state. Uh, since then, we've become pretty good friends with them. But we set up this, this uh, coalition to help educate the public on simple ways to conserve water. Last year, we spent a little over $500,000 on radio buys, some TV, um, some printed material. And if anybody on this call would like some printed material, we'll be happy to supply it to you. We've been distributing it to retailers and landscape contractors across the state. There's some billing inserts. If you'd like to put that uh, in your bills that you send out, just shoot me an email. It's uh, jim at tnlaonline.org. Um, and we'll be happy to get that out to you. So we decided that we wanted to go look for some additional funds to help pay for this education, educating of the consumer on water conservation. We came up with a figure of $5 million. We've been working with the House Appropriations Committee and Senate Finance Committee to get this put into the bill. Um, the vote for the $5 million for the House will be taken Monday in committee. There's a really good chance that it is going to get put in there. Uh, in the Senate, we were not able to get it into Article 6 of the budget. Uh, it's actually been placed in Article 11, and what that means, uh, Article 11 is kind of the wish list. Riders that, that don't get into the full bill, they're kind of put in this, this little area, and they'll be debated at another time, maybe on the Senate or House floor. So at least we do have it in Article 11 there. Hopefully we'll have it in Article 6 in the House, and that'll put us in, in great shape uh, to, to get that money for, for water conservation. Now that $5 million will not just go to Texas Water Smart. Uh, it could go to the Water Foundation. They do water education. And it could also go to Water IQ. Um, so we would just have to apply for grants to, to pull those funds down. Um, legislative session, TNLA, we're tracking around 50 pieces of legislation right now. Um, those are, are bills that will have a direct impact on the nursery landscape industry. Some are good and some are bad, and I'll, I'll get to those a little later. Um, through the Texas Ag Council, uh, I'm a vice chair of the Texas Ag Council, and Darren Turley is going to join us later. He's the chairman. Uh, it's, it's a group of ag, ag commodities and ag associations uh, across the state. There's 67 or 68 of us. We're tracking around 300 pieces of legislation, and we'll probably be tracking 500 um, when the filing deadline hits next Friday, March 8th. Uh, TNLA will probably be tracking 100 or 75 to 100. Um, it's just been kind of weird session. Not many bills have been filed compared to, to the last session and the session before. And usually there's 7,500 to 8,000 pieces of, of legislation filed, and they're not even to 3,500 at this point, and there's only a week left. So that, that's good news. That's less things that we have to, to worry about and, and try to intervene and amend and help pass. Um, immigration, I know some of y'all are aware that back in 07, I, well, TNLA helped form the Texas Employers for Immigration Reform. We were looking for a fixed, comprehensive fix to immigration. Uh, there's a, there's not a level playing field out there in our industry and other industries. Uh, we we need reliable a reliable workforce that's legal. Uh, we're, we're not pushing for citizenship. We're just pushing to expand guest worker programs so uh, we can get the workers to meet the needs of, of business in the state of Texas. And the funny thing about it is. This session, only probably 10 bills have been filed regarding e-verification or fines on employers. 
um, in the past, there would be 40 or 50. The Republican Party has, has kind of changed its tone a little bit in, in regard to immigration because they, they understand that um, business has been right on this for years. There does need to be a fix, and Washington, D.C. does need to fix this problem. Um, so we're seeing a lot more Republican legislators backing off of filing, you know, anti-business bills regarding the immigration debate. So that, that's real good news. Uh, commissioner Staples, our Ag Commissioner, we've met with him twice in the last two weeks. Uh, he's been working on this issue. He's, his counterparts from across the country, they put a letter together to send to Congress that's uh, supporting a comprehensive fix. Uh, he's working with the legislature right now to, to get some resolutions passed in the House and the Senate to send to D.C. saying, you know, it's, it's time to fix this problem. It's time to stop playing politics. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But it, it's real good news, and it, it makes us feel, you know, good. Plus, we don't have to worry about fighting all those pieces of the legislation all session. Another interesting point, career and technology education, um, I've been working on this issue since 2003. It's probably my favorite issue, um, giving kids, you know, skilled, skilled knowledge to go out and, and work and, and have a good paying job with benefits. Uh, our industry depends on this. Uh, our economy depends on this. And it's, this issue has been ignored for years and years and years. This session, there have been so many pieces of legislation filed that, that supports career and technology and is promoting it. Um, something big is going to happen this session in regard, in regard to that. And, and we're extremely excited about it. Uh, another big issue that concerns us every session is the uh, right for a landscape contractor to design a landscape. A little history here. Uh, a few years ago, oh, probably 10 years ago actually, the landscape architects wanted to have their own practice act. And at the time, uh, TNLA had opposed it. Now we do have landscape architects who are members of TNLA. Uh, we opposed it, but we ended up cutting the deal they could have their practice act as long as our landscape professionals would still have the ability to design landscapes. So that was done and they got their act and we were all, all happy. But each session since then, the lobbyists for the landscape architects has tried to come in and remove the language that allows us to design. So it's a big fight every session. Um, it, 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 it's just not good for the industry. And we do support the architects, but you know we've got to, we've got to protect our folks also. So we're going to be looking out for that, um, you know, just like we do every session. Hey Jim, uh, you, hey Jim, let me interrupt for a second. There's a question that popped up that's kind of related. Are there been any bills up that specify that uh, uh, only licensed irrigators do installs or repairs? Uh, uh, actually, funny that you mentioned that. Uh, full disclosure, I serve on the Texas Turf Irrigation Association Board and have done so since 2007. Um, I've floated a piece of legislation that I drafted this week to a state rep in San Antonio, and they are probably going to file it. Um, so hopefully we can uh, get that passed. Last session, we, we with TTIA and a couple other groups passed House Bill 2507, which allowed cities to fine people who are practicing irrigation without a license. Um, this is just some cleanup language to make sure it includes maintenance, because I know City of San Antonio, their saws, uh, they're setting up a system where they can go out and enforce this. I mean, it, it's a money generator. Uh, plus, you know, if we're going to try to conserve water, we need professionals putting those pipes in the ground and, and somebody who knows exactly what they're doing. That's a good question. Uh, some of the biggest bills that, that we're involved with is House Bill 4 and Senate Bill 4. That is a, uh, that is legislation that, that 
redesigns the Water Development Board, and it sets up a fund within the Water Development Board to fund the state water plan. The state water plan was passed back in 1997, and it'll cost $53 billion to implement. It's infrastructure needs, reservoirs maybe, um, but it it's, would, would set up a fund that would allow low interest grants to go out to uh, water districts and municipalities. Uh, House Bill 11, and I don't remember the Senate bill off the top of my head, would appropriate $2 billion out of that rainy day fund I was talking about. That $2 billion would go in there. The interest would help you know, keep the fund alive and then you know the small interest on the uh, loans would uh, also support it. So we're we're in the middle of that fight. We're for it. Uh, the Senate, their version, does not call for conservation or for any of the money to go to conservation. In the House bill, it, requ it would require 20% of the funds to go to water conservation. I'm not sure where that's going, but we we do support the aspect of the water conservation. Uh, let's see what time it is. If we got a few more minutes before Darren jumps on, I'll go over a couple bills with you. Um, some of y'all may recall the desert plant bill. That's legislation that would require, it used to, the old versions would require any time you were shipping the desert plant anywhere, you'd have to have a tag with it verifying that you'd not gone out on somebody's property and stole it. Um, apparently there's there's some problems with this out in El Paso, and they think that putting more fees and, and, and things like that on our businesses is going to stop people from stealing and uh, uh, trespassing. Um, long story, but uh, the bill's been filed again, and I went and visited with uh, the freshman representative this week and told her our concerns, and um, she's agreed to fix them. So we may be supporting the bill now. It, it would exempt out our property owners who grow plants on their own land, um, people who go out and harvest off of other people's land, they would just have to get a letter from the landowner and sign a compliance agreement with TDA, and they're fine with that. I've, I've visited with them, so that, that's real good news from the week. Um, there's a few bills out there that are going after homeowners associations, and TNLA, we, we've got some position statements that say that um, homeowners should have the, the right choose what kind of landscape they want to have in their yard. Um, some homeowners associations restrict certain kind of landscapes. So House Bill 727 was filed by Cindy Burkett and it keeps homeowners associations from prohibiting a homeowner from planting drought resistant plants. And we got the word cacti added into it this week. Uh, just to make sure that they didn't try to ban cacti. Um, so we're happy with that bill. House Bill 449, it does pretty much the same thing, but it says that they can't prohibit a homeowner from zeroscaping. Uh, we're very supportive of that. I mean, the homeowner, if they want to zeroscape, they should be able to do it. It's their property. And uh, Senate Bill 198 by Senator Watson here in Austin is also the drought-resistant plants uh, bill. Citrus legislation, uh, some of you are familiar with the uh, Asian citrus psyllid and the citrus greening down in the Rio Grande Valley that was found in two groves on January 13th of last year. Um, we've been working on this issue for a long time, but there's going to be a bill probably filed that's going to require all of our nursery growers down there to build a certain type of screen to, screen to grow their plants. Um, we're probably going to oppose, but we're not sure yet. We haven't seen the bill, so that is on our radar. Um, there's a tree bill out there, and this is this is a great example. We've got some members who are for this bill, and we've got some members who are against this bill. What it would do would tell cities that they cannot control tree removal in their ETJs. In the cities. They couldn't stop somebody from cutting down a tree um, like they do in Austin. But in, in the cities, if you did cut down a tree, you'd have to plant another one or pay into their, their tree planting fund. Um, 
we've got some maintenance people and arborists who, who don't like the bill, but on the other hand, we've got members who do support it because they can sell more of their product. Um, we're probably going to be neutral on it because we have members on both sides. Uh, our, our position statements probably tell us to support it, but you know, if we got members on both sides, we we just can't do that. And what were ETGs, Jim? ETJs, extraterritorial ETG. jurisdictions. It's uh, cities have. Um, they're not necessarily annexed into the city yet, but at some point they will be. Um, they do give them police service and sewer service and water service, uh, but they're not officially annexed. It's just an extraterritorial jurisdiction. Sorry about that. Uh, there's a native seed bill that's up next week. Uh, they're trying to move native seeds to TxDOT, Texas Department of Transportation. We don't think this is a good idea. Uh, they're also going to try to form a commission in another bill um, to study all this. Uh, the Native Seed Trade Association, they're opposed to it. I'm not sure what we're going to do just yet. Uh, our president and I are going to sit down this afternoon and visit more about it. But that is on the list. Um, there's a House Bill 1519 filed by Representative Sheffield the person who, who defeated Representative Miller, um, and actually Representative Miller brought this to our attention, it would deem portions of uh, the Brazos River some kind of sanctuary and would prohibit us from pulling rock and gravel out of, out of that part of the, the river. And apparently our industry uses a lot of that, so we're going to have to go oppose that bill as well. Um, Regulatory issues, we're dealing with some invasive species issues right now. I serve on the TIPSI board, that's the Texas Invasive Plant and Pest Council, and they have been submitting the plants to TDA, uh, trying to get them banned, and get them on the list so our members you know, couldn't grow them or sell them anymore. Um, I think we're probably going to stop the three that have been submitted. But on the regulatory side, you know, we've got to we've got to watch our 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 uh, issues there as well, even during the legislative session. Um, and while I got your attention, <laughs> I want to talk about PAC, our political action committee, just for one second. Our PAC, we raise money through it from our members, and we use that money to contribute to elected officials in the House and the Senate. Uh, people running for governor, lieutenant governor, ag commissioner. Uh, our PAC has grown tremendously. Back in 2010, we spent $115,000 in the primary election and the general election. And it's not buying votes. It's not even renting votes. It's, uh, it's access. It's helping support people who support our industry stay in office. And, and the best example I have to give you right now Two weeks ago, we walked into Representative Kyle Cassell's office. He's a new state rep out of Bryan College Station. And uh, I sat down, and we'd asked him to carry a piece of legislation for us. And he brings his staff in the office, and he turns to the staff, and he points at me, and he said, this is the guy who was the first person who signed up to support my campaign. And I was like, okay. He remembers it. We gave him a check. We endorsed him. We stood with him before anybody else jumped on board with him, and that's priceless. So when you give money to the pack, that money goes to people like Kyle, who's been a farmer and rancher his whole life. He's been involved with Farm Bureau. He understands business. He understands our issues, and he will be a solid supporter of ours as long as he's in the, the legislative session. So when you do see me sending stuff out asking for a contribution, even if it's $20, that's fine, but that money goes to great things for your business. I mean, it, it truly is an investment in your business. Has, uh, has Darren joined us yet? Yeah, Charlie? I'm on. All right. Well, uh, we've got Darren Turley who's going to speak.
to you a little bit about Ag Council and, and the importance of, of all of us working together. Darren's um, the executive director of the Texas Association of Dairymen, and he's out of the, the Stephenville area. Are you in Dublin? or? Yes, born and raised up here in Dublin, yes, sir. All right. Well, I'm going to give you the floor. You can speak five, ten minutes and, and let them know what you're thinking. Well, as Jim mentioned earlier, the Texas Agriculture Council, uh, we are the, currently the chairman and vice chairman of that group and uh, have got good working relations together, and I think that's a, kind of a, a statement to that group. Uh, the Texas Agriculture Council is a coalition of uh, over 65 ag groups there at the Capitol, and they range from um, all aspects of agriculture, from your general commodities to uh, exotic wildlife and, and all the things in between. Uh, we come together weekly during session and work through a, a bill track process to see what legislation is moving and uh, is going to uh, be addressed this session, uh, most of which Jim has referred to you already. Uh, we have been watching and working through as an organization. The need for this or the, the real presence of this is, as you all know, agriculture continues to shrink. Uh, just as Jim talked about your pack and we do the same in our industry, uh, we, we're fighting to be heard and we're fighting to, to be able to make the new legislators that are more urban all the time understand what ag is facing out in the market. And so as a coming together as this group, we have the ability to work together. Uh, it's not that you have to support every issue or be on the same side of every issue, but it is the ability to work through rules and regulatory before they become a problem for you. We get to get our word in and get our voice heard maybe on setting up some of these parameters before they get put into law. And uh, it, it's very simple to go down some of the list that Jim has just went through with you and see that immigration is a big issue to my industry the same as it is yours. Uh, you can go through uh, a lot of the, the issues of trucking and transportation, the issues that we all deal with that carry an ag commodity, it's very easy to be on the same side. And I can say that for the most of the bills that are passed, especially this session with our shorter number of, of bills and the, this kind of reduced workload this time seems like compared to where we've been, uh, it, it's, we're at 90% or better on all issues. We nearly always get along. We're always on the same page. And so uh, we work pretty diligently together to try to be sure that Everybody is aware of what's going on, and some of those organizations have lobbyists. Uh, some rely on us almost to keep them up in control of the different uh, issues that are going on at the Capitol. And with that, you, you have the ability to have some good dialogue and some good discussion from a broad spectrum of agriculture to work out a lot of issues before they ever uh, really get set into law. A group sample meeting monthly out of session during the interim and uh, continue to work together to see uh, what rulemaking and other uh, issues are, are approaching us throughout the year. And there's a lot of background work done then. A lot of work is done to get acquainted with representatives. I know that uh, Jim mentioned Kyle Cassell and Kyle Cassell is, is, is going to be one of those really good representatives for ag that we just got in. Uh, we were very concerned in their industry about the, the amount of new faces this year at the Capitol. There were so many freshmen and then another large percentage that are just sophomore members that we were very concerned about what we were going to see as far as ag leaders. And I'm very thankful to say, and I can speak for quite a few other groups who've had the conversation that we feel very fortunate of some of the members we've gained this session. Uh, Cox still being one of them. Uh, Trent Ashby uh, just come in and spoke to Ag Council this last week. He's another Right, very uh, ag-related young man, come from a dairy farm in his early years. But uh, nonetheless, we've, we've got some really good representation coming in that understands the plight of agriculture. And that's that's a very fortunate situation to be in whenever you look at how urban our population is in the House of Representatives and also the Senate. So Ag Council continues to work to make those relationships to get acquainted with representatives to kind of see what their uh, issues and desires are going to be coming into session, uh, have a discussion with them on some of our issues as well, and continue to try to make that relationship get started on such a positive note. 
uh, with that, we're able to get an open door to a lot of those offices, and we use each individual's group's uh, acquaintance with their representatives or representatives that are more closely connected to their organization's business and uh, take advantage of that a little bit to help us be able to try to move some legislation and be sure our voice is heard. Um, we are, uh, excuse me, there a question? I was just going to say, what what bills are y'all mainly concerned with right now? And I mean, I know y'all had you had to leave early the other day because you had one bill up in committee. But let give them an example of, of you know something that you work on daily. Well, uh, Senator Seliger from uh, the Panhandle from the Amarillo area's uh, Senate Bill 272 of the Water uh, is is one that we're concerned with. Uh, just. Uh, basically asking for probably full disclosure of almost everyone in, well, in the state, I started saying in, in a water district, but in the state to be able to record what water they're using. Uh, there's some people that are on the side of oil and gas that believe they need to report uh, more than what they're getting from them. This will give the Water Development Board more information to try to help work through the water plan in the future. But uh, with that, of course, is, there's a lot of concern with, with ag and water. And we are the big user in the state. Uh, most of it's in irrigation, but it's still nonetheless, when you start looking at the list, we're on top. And that makes a pretty big bullseye for us when it comes to water regulation. And so uh, that gives you an example of one that we're watching very closely, uh, have worked long hours on. Uh, there was a subcommittee for water that was put together, uh, I guess, uh, basically a year ago, maybe even a little more, Jim. You may know the date better than I do, but for quite some time we worked through what we felt like was legislation we could handle, uh, put that out as a kind of a working paper before session, and then uh, come in to the first session and then address some of these bills going forward. But uh, water by no means is, 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 a, is an easy topic for anyone in this group. Uh, it's definitely a concern, and, and in the state after the drought conditions we had, you are definitely going to see some new legislation and some new direction on that state water plan. And so that's one of the one of the key areas that, that it stands out for sure. Jim, that's about my timeline. I'll I'll turn it back to you. All right. Well just on, on the water stuff and, and I touched on it briefly, um, I mean T and A we're in an interesting position regarding water and, and the prime example is LCRA, the Lower um, River, <laughs> Lower Colorado River Authority, <clears throat> that um, has the the lakes out here by Austin, and there's been a fight over the last couple years on water they release downstream to rice farmers and turf producers. On one hand, City of Austin, I mean we we need sufficient water to to meet the needs of of you know daily life but we also need to water our landscapes and, and keep our grass and trees alive. But on the other hand, we need our rice farmers and our turf grass producers uh, to get the water that they're supposed to get under contract. And last year, the water was not given to them. And there's a, there's a long story to that, and I, I won't bore you with all the details, uh, but this year, they're probably not going to get their water either. I mean, the Highland Lakes are, are still very low. Uh, the drought had a huge effect on them. Uh, but as an association, we're on both sides of that issue. And I can argue both points, and our members can argue both points. But, I mean, it gets real tricky uh, on situations like that. But Ag Council has, has done a great job. I mean, Farm Bureau, um, all of them are on the balance. Uh, they understand it, and, and they're, they're not just all ag, and they understand the business side of it. Uh, for our industry, so it, you know we're in a pretty good place. Um, and like Darren said, that the force of Ag Council is really strong. They they really helped us out a couple sessions ago when there was a bill that was trying to take away that right to design legislation. Uh, there was some open space language that's uh, in statute, and that was going to be stricken. So about seven or eight Ag Council members went over there and and uh, signed a card saying that they opposed uh, the bill, which helped hold that thing up and ultimately defeat it. So, yeah, good times at Ag Council. Well, Joe, have you joined us? Yes, sir. 
All right. Well, we've got Joe Cox on the phone with us, and uh, he's with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Um, is your title still Assistant Vice Chancellor for External Relations? It is, or whatever you'd like to call me. All right. Well, Joe, Joe's got a lot of history at the Capitol. He's, he's worked for, for speakers for Craddock uh, a couple sessions. He worked uh, in the House for years. Uh, but uh, he's going to visit with us a little bit about um, what Extension does and, and how they work with us and, and other ag groups through the legislative and regulatory process. So you got the floor, Joe. Sure, Jim. Sounds good. Appreciate everyone. Appreciate you inviting me on the call. First of all, I'd say that you know, as a segue from our discussion with with the cooperation that we have at Ag Council, I would just uh, I would second that and say that you know that's the relationships that we have not only. I represent four, um, uh, you know, institutions of higher education that are under the law, but you all know them as AgriLife Research and AgriLife Extension and the Forest Service and and the Vet Lab. But um, so we're over in another article of appropriations, and uh, you know, it's kind of in another world. But we have the opportunity once a week to meet back together, you know, at Ag Council and uh, and engage our stakeholders and. Um, I just can't say enough about Jim and and, uh, and and Darren and appreciate their friendship and their support and you know support from y'all for an initiative that we have um, is so much more meaningful. Um, you know, it's 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 uh, it's one thing hearing from a from a third party on a certain initiative or issue, um, and um, it's it, it's very effective. I'll run down just a couple we're we're working on right now. We, we too have an initiative in water that um, spans across three agencies, AgriLife Research, AgriLife Extension, and the, Agri and the Texas A&M Engineering um, Experiment Station. And um, we have partially funded over on the Senate side um, in, as far as work group recommendations. And what we would do with this is it really would um, back away from the water issue and, and and look at it, you know, agricultural, municipal, industrial, um, all the uses, and and see, you know, and, and apply some research that we have uh, now to educational efforts and to look for new discoveries in uh, in, in technologies to help us conserve water. Um, <clears throat> of interest to your group, you know, we have a lot of faculty who are telling us that. And a lot of the discoveries that we can make over on the row crop side, as far as drought tolerance or you know, improvement, there's no reason that, that those can't transfer over into the turf and ornamental side. Um, so we're very excited about that. We also have, Jim mentioned earlier in the call, you know, the, the issue with the citrus salad and citrus greening. Uh, we do have a research item um, that, again, is partially funded over on the Senate side to look at vector-borne diseases. And um, we're doing the best we can to educate some members of the legislature that, you know, that that a lot of you know that vectors and vector-borne diseases affect plant, animal, and human health. And um, then likewise, the discoveries that we make um, in regards to those diseases can have applications in across plant, animal, and human health. So um, those are just those are a couple of the items that, that we're working on to get some funding. Um, it is early. Um, I, I don't remember both work group on the Senate side and House subcommittee on the House side uh, being finished with their recommendations and it not even be March. So they, they finished up this week, and uh, you know today Mar today is March first, and out there, and so uh, they're moving quickly, but it's early. It, it, Jim was talking about an appropriation a minute ago. And, you know, there's still the full committee, there's still the, the floors, and then as we all know, um, we get to where, you know, a lot of times the real action is, and that's the conference committee at, at the end. But um, but we're engaged, appreciate y'all's support on those issues, appreciate Jim, you know, and being able to put our heads together every week on, on issues like this. And um, we have a whole bunch of other things going on, but I don't want to use up my time. But uh, and be happy to answer any questions. Okay. 
You got any questions coming through, Charlie? Um, yep, I've, I've already answered a couple of them because I had taken some notes on what you said, so I answered a couple of them. And, uh, but the others seem, everybody seems to be pretty good right now. Okay. Well, Joe, I appreciate you being here. Darren, if you're still here, I appreciate your time as well. Well, you bet. You bet, Jim, any time. All right, I'll see you next week. You bet, Joe. Sounds, sounds good. Well, we want to open up for for uh, some questions, or I can go back over some other bills that, that may have some interest to people. May yeah. not. <laughs> what I would suggest is, if, if folks, if you got a question, go ahead and type it in the question box. And, Jim, if you've got a couple of things that you can uh, – I know you left a couple of things toward the end here just to allow folks a little more time. So won't you – uh, start off on a, on those things, and and I'll see if there are any more questions pop up. Well, this may have interest to you. It may not. Uh, House Bill 419 by uh, Represent, Representative Farias out of San Antonio. Uh, he filed a bill to change Arbor Day uh, to the first Friday in November. Uh, it's currently been in March, I believe. Years ago, before I I started working here, uh, Eddie Edmondson and and staff work to get it on March, whatever it was, I'm not sure. But they came to us a few months ago and asked if we had a problem moving it, and, and we didn't. So that bill was in committee this week, and it's already passed out. So it'll be heading to the House Calendars Committee and then onto the House floor uh, for full debate, which shouldn't be any at all. Uh, let's see what other bills we all might care about. Um, does anybody have any questions over those? Uh, the zero scaping bill or the drought resistance bills. Um, that's I we did have amazing. one comment that said Arbor Day is currently the last Friday in April. All right, very good. <laughs> well I was close. Yeah. Uh, an interesting bill has been filed regarding uh, drones. Um, there's a lot of people who aren't real big fans of it, but we had a, one of our members uh, send me an email saying they had concern with the bill because they are in the process of, of developing technology for a drone to spray their crops and to monitor their their property. <laughs> so all sorts of things get filed during session that affect us that I would have no idea that we would, would even consider caring about it. Um, let's see here. Another question came in is, uh, uh, will the webinar be available in electronic or written form? And I would mentioned earlier that it's being recorded, so you'll be getting a recording of of um, the the webinar today. But, Jim, you might mention how folks can get a hold of your weekly uh, legislative wrap-up. Yes, and, and most of y'all should be on the email list, but if you're not, um, you can email me and I'll make sure you get added every Friday morning, or we try for the morning, but at some point on Friday, I send out a an update of things that happened during the week, and I attach a, a copy of our bill track list. Yeah, let me explain that to you. What our bill track list is, is, you know, all the bills we're following. We work with... Uh, with Gavin, our contract lobbyist, and we go in and pay half of the fees for Telecon, and that's a system that is incredible. It's a great tool for people like me. Uh, you can go in, and every morning I get an email uh, of all these bills that have been filed, and I've set up keyword searches uh, prior to session for this system to look for. For example, immigration or plants or conservation or water. Uh, so every morning I get an email with all the bills that have any of my keywords in it. So I have to go through there, read through the bills, see if it affects us, see if we like it, see if we don't like it, and then I add that bill to the track list. So each week whenever you get um, my legislative update, that track list is everything uh, the, our, our keywords have hit and we think poses a threat or is um, you know, possibly good for the nursery landscape industry. 
I mean, it really is an incredible system. You can check, you know, how people voted on bills. Uh, you can see, you know, who's most likely to vote with a certain member. Um, the, the technology on this thing is absolutely <laughs> outstanding. It, it, it's mind-boggling. And they give updates. They they take, you know, people's press releases. Uh, they have somebody sitting in, in every committee, and after the committee's over, that staff person writes up a report. So if I were to miss, you know, some committee I, I was interested in, I, next day I could go on the site, click on it, and pull up the report, and it'll tell me what happened. So it's 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 worth it's worth the dollars. It's pretty expensive, but it, it's worth every penny of it. One more, well, one more question on irrigation. Um, this this comment was uh, that um, this person thought they had heard last year that violations would be a Class C misdemeanor rather than a fine. I guess that's going back to that House license. Yep, yep. In the legislation, it says Class C misdemeanor uh, with a fine up to five hundred dollars. The problem is a lot of cities aren't implementing it. I mean, San Antonio is the first one who's, who's going to do that. Uh, we, we've been pushing cities uh, as best as we can. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's – actually, I think the penalty should be higher, but that's just my own opinion. Um, but, yeah, it, it is a Class C misdemeanor in statute. Okay. And if we do get the other part passed on the maintenance and repair, uh, that will also – fall under the Class C misdemeanor. Gotcha. Well, that's all the questions that have come in, Jim. Any last comments? Uh, yeah, just look for my legislative updates. If there's a certain piece of legislation you want more information about or a copy of the bill, shoot me an email, and I'll be happy to send it to you. Um, email is probably the best way to catch me, but you can always call, and I'll call you back. Uh, it may take a little longer than normal. Uh, we've We've only got 87 days left of this legislative session, and it's actually but actually 87 days and nights because we're starting <laughs> to work from getting up there about 7, 7.30 and getting home, you know, 7 or 8 at night. But, yeah. Uh, but, seriously, anything you all need, let me know. I'm, I work for you. Um, I'll take your opinions and comments on legislation, and uh, we'll go from there. Well, Jim, we appreciate your efforts and um, the sleepless nights that you, you have during this time of the year, and and we appreciate Darren and Joe being online as well. I will remind folks that, um, that of course, today's webinar is re being recorded, and it's going to be on the Ellison Chair website along with the previous webinars that we've had as part of this series. And you can see the URL there at the top, ellisonchair.tamu.edu multimedia webinars. And, and um, you can just go to the Ellison Chair website and, and uh, click on multimedia there on the right and you get to it. And, and uh, so Jim's comments will be posted up there as soon as we get the recording uh, fixed up. And so um, with that, I'll, I'll thank everybody for their attendance. And we'll see you at the next webinar. And, Jim, thank you again uh, for that wealth and plethora of information. Very good job. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Appreciate yep. it. Have a great yep. weekend. Yep.